If you've ever played a game for any length of time, you've probably noticed how often gameplay is tied directly to an animation. You see this in Elden Ring when an enemy damages you in the middle of their attack animation, or in Valorant when bullets return to your magazine only after a certain point in the reload animation. There are lots of ways to handle this, and just as many ways to end up with messy code, especially if you have to manually synchronize gameplay to the animation it's currently playing. Today I want to focus on one solution in particular that lends itself well to the data-driven design of my engine's entity component system, which is called... When we think of animations, it's tempting to just imagine a sequence of sprites to play with some time between each frame, and the story ends there. This is correct in its most basic form, but an animation can represent a lot more. One powerful idea is attaching data to specific frames in the form of events. These events are optional, but when present, the animation system can detect them and trigger a response based on the event type. I don't want to pack all of that data into the animation file, especially since every direction an entity is facing has its own animation. Duplicating hitbox data across all of them would be redundant. So, instead of storing the hitbox properties directly in each frame, I'll just store an ID that resolves to the full hitbox definition during runtime. For example, this is the hitbox that should spawn during the player axe animation. This will be its ID, which is just an enum, it will do 1 damage, have a radius of 0.25, and I can add any other info I want, like the directional offsets relative to the player's position. This neatly separates the data, so it's easier for me to manage. To actually store these events in an animation, I use a variant, also known as a union, of all the different event types, because in the future you can imagine there will be events for stuff like playing sounds during an animation. If you don't know what a union is in C++, it's basically a type that combines any number of types into one. This union can either be A, B, or C at any one time. You can use some methods to check which type it is before treating it like that type as you normally would, allowing us to reference different types with one definition. In order for this to be possible, the union's size is equal to the size of the largest type that comprises it. In this example, B is the largest at 32 bytes, so the union will also be at least 32 bytes, ignoring alignment and all that stuff. While this might sound like wasted memory, it allows us to neatly store different data types together in one container, which is exactly how I want to store different event types in a single animation. Now I can represent an animation with this structure here. I have a list of delays between frames, a list of associated sprites, and a list of lists for events, since one frame might contain multiple events. I'll also mark the sprites and events list as optional, since some animations might not have any sprites or events. With this setup, I can spawn a hitbox when the player swings their axe without manually syncing any timers or frames. This also means I could speed up or slow down the attack animation without worrying about the hitbox timing. There's one big problem though, there's no collision detection in my game, so this hitbox does nothing at the moment. Collisions typically have two steps, detection and resolution. Detection is figuring out whether a collision happened between two objects. Resolution works by spawning a collision event, which is then used to make something happen to the colliding objects. For now, I'm just going to focus on detection. Let's start by making a system that iterates all entities with a transform and circle collider, and compares that entity to all other entities with a transform and circle collider. When two entities overlap, we can spawn a collision event that will later be used to resolve this collision. If I add some entities to test this, well, yeah, clearly this approach kind of sucks. Let's figure out what's actually going on when we create a view in the system. A view is a data type I made that contains all the components you want to query. By itself, it doesn't actually do much. When you call for each on a view though, it runs the code only on the entities that have all of the specified components in the view using a lambda. When we create a view, the engine will first find the smallest specified component pool. In this example, that's component B. Then, when we call the foreach function, it will iterate all the entities that have component B, and it checks if they also have components A and C. If the entity has all of the required components, then it will run the lambda on this entity. This is the basis of the entire entity component system, and gives us a pretty efficient way to iterate entities with a specified set of components. There's a pretty obvious downside to this though, which we could see in the collision system. I was reconstructing the view every single iteration and calling for each on it, which gets super expensive. To fix this, I went ahead and refactored the entire entity component system, and I had to learn a bunch of really really super fun C++ template concepts, which resulted in this little method I added called getPacked. GetPacked does essentially the same thing as calling for each, but instead of constructing the view on the fly, it builds the view up front and returns it as a list that I could iterate using normal for loops. 
Now I can just create the view once per frame, which is much faster. On top of that, I can start the inner loop after the current outer loop index, which ignores entities we've already compared and effectively cuts the number of iterations in half. Before these changes, I had around 5 FPS with 1000 colliders on screen. With the refactor, I now get around 4000 FPS, so it was a pretty effective change. In the future, this will be even faster when I add stuff like spatial partitions in order to reduce the number of collision checks. But for now, this is good enough. After adding some basic collision resolution, the tool can now damage a tree each time it's hit. Once a tree's health runs out, it gets deleted. I added a rudimentary particle effect when the tree gets destroyed, but you can imagine the tree will drop some wood after I add an inventory system. I've been lying to you a little bit throughout the video. While the axe animation looks like a single animation, it's actually two animations overlaid on top of each other. I have two sprite sheets. One contains the player base animations regardless of what tool they're holding, and another sheet contains just the axe. This lets me quickly swap out the animation depending on the tool type the player is holding. To add a pickaxe to the game, I just have to make a new sprite sheet for it, and a new attack type that spawns a hitbox with its own properties. Most importantly, the pickaxe hitbox exists on a different collision layer than the axe hitbox. Collision layers are represented by bit masks that let me control what colliders interact with each other. Each collider has a layer mask and a target mask. A collision only occurs if both colliders' layer masks are included in the other's target mask. If not, the engine won't even run a collision check, saving processing time and allowing us to ignore certain collision types. So, putting this all together, now the axe can only destroy trees, and the pickaxe can only destroy rocks, thanks to the collision layers. Before this video ends, I just want to thank you guys for the support and the patience again. I've rewrote this video probably like five times in the last two months, so thanks for waiting. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed, and if you made it this far, please consider subscribing if you haven't already and leaving a like. It's a huge motivator for me. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys next time.